Would you welcome the stage my longtime friend, Phil King? Thanks. You don't need this, right? Nah, I'm good. Okay. Yeah, he asked me if I needed the microphone. They've got two microphones on me now. I feel like Robo Man or something with this, all this. Thanks for having me back. And I was trying to think the last time uh, I get these notes up here that I spoke was, uh, I guess, right after the last legislative session. You know, we meet every odd year, every other year, and uh, uh, for 140 days, because Texas was really set up for us to be a, a citizen's legislature where you had to. Uh, uh, you served on a part-time basis and uh, you would come back and, and have to live and work and uh, earn a living and raise a family under the, under the laws that you, that you put in place. And most states aren't like that. Most uh, places they, they, they meet year-round almost and, and it's really more of a full-time job, a paid position. We don't do it uh, as a paid position. So it's, it's really a, a, a truly a citizen's legislature. It's changed a little bit as my, my uh, good friend Senator Craig Estes will tell you. Uh, just in the years that we've been in, uh, it's gotten uh, busier and more and more active. And you know, when, when your state's got the, about the 12th largest uh, GDP economy in the world, if we were our own nation, which really is good to think about sometimes, but, if, but it, it, it really is turning into more and more of a full-time job. I know Craig and I both uh, used to uh, uh, schedule, of course, our 140 days. And, Maybe once a month you would have to go down for a few days, and now I know I find myself in Austin uh, at least a day or two every week, even when we're not in session and there's always things going on, and I end up budgeting three or four days a week, and I know Craig does too, doing legislative stuff. So the job's really evolved a lot. But uh, we also, uh, you may know, just uh, uh, adjourned, and we uh, finished our 140 days uh, at the end of May, and uh, we heard something like there was something like six thousand, well actually it was 6,631 bills that were filed by, by the 181 members of the Texas legislature. And no, I have earth, no earthly idea why they filed that many bills. I mean, does anybody here really think, and there's thousands of amendments on top of those bills, and anybody here really think we need 6,000 new laws? No, I mean, it's the other way around. But anyway, we have to work through all those, and we did, and, and uh, we didn't quite uh, get everything done. Uh, was a little bit of a different session uh, uh, for a number of reasons. And did anybody see the scuffle on Fox News kind of at the end there? The last day in the House, not the Senate, they're much more reserved. Uh, and, and the last day in the House, uh, we had a little bit of a fight break out between some of the members and the chief. I got to feel like a cop again and help pull people off and settle them down and all that, but got a little out of hand. Uh, in, in, in defense of everyone that was engaged in that, uh, even those that were completely and absolutely wrong, and there were several of them, but uh, we'd all been on the floor for, I guess, two weeks straight probably, and uh, no Sundays off. We were trying to wrap it up, get everything done, and everybody's edges were uh, a little, we were a little tense. Everybody was a little afraid, and uh, somebody said something they shouldn't have said at a time they shouldn't have said it, and one thing led to another, and people were acting like we shouldn't have acted. But uh, it all, it'll all work out. We're going to go back pretty soon uh, to try to finish up uh, in what's called a special session. And Texas is a little bit different because, you know, we only meet that 140 days. And so the Constitution says that the governor can call a special session uh, when there's work yet to be done. And those are called in 30-day increments. And I've been, it's really not that unusual. Uh, often we have to go back because you know, we need another few weeks or another month or two to finish up all the state's work. Uh, this will be my 13th uh, special session since I've been in office. So we do that pretty routinely. Uh, they're a little bit different in that in a regular session, any member of the legislature can file any bill on any topic, which is why you got 6,600 filed. In a special session, we can only deal with the topics that the governor selects. It's called putting them on the call, C-A-L-L. -L. And so you'll read in the press about the governor's put the following things on the call. And he's put about 20 items uh, on the call for this, uh, this, this upcoming session. The, probably the three top ones, uh, the first one is property tax reform, uh, which uh, is, is, I hear more about property tax issues uh, uh, from constituents than, than anything else. 
and we all feel it so much every day. The state doesn't actually have a property tax. Uh, we, we raise money through sales tax and severance tax on oil and gas and franchise tax, which is an evil thing, and, and uh, a few other items. But uh, the, the local government, your cities, your counties, school, school districts, things like that, uh, they're funded by property tax and, and then, of course, uh, cities uh, a little bit by sales tax. And so uh, we don't actually have a property tax. Where we do have a role in it is we set up the laws that actually design the property tax system and the appraisal system and all of that. And we have oversight for that, uh, to some extent at least. And, and then where we really do play, have some input though, is on school finance. Because the state funds about half of your public schools. And if you add up all the money going into public schools, state, local, and the federal part, you know, you're talking about an 80 plus billion dollar uh, industry in the state. So it's a lot of money, probably for you in here, your property taxes, I know mine are about 70% of them are schools because it's an ex expensive proposition trying to educate, you know, 5 million kids in a very culturally, culturally diverse uh, 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 state. And so it ends up costing a lot of money and taking a lot of work and, and absorbing uh, a lot of tax dollars. I go into this detail uh, just to ask you to do something for me. The governor wants us to come back, and by the way, Governor Abbott's a good friend, and he's a great job, and, he's, and he does a great job, and he's a great guy, and, and he deserves a lot of credit uh, for having the courage to call us back because none of us want to come back. We all want to be home and see our families and, and, and make some money and, and get back to work. But he put property tax reform on the call. I really would encourage you when you get back to the office today to get on the email, get on Facebook and ask him to expand that. He needs to expand it to include uh, a, a comprehensive review of school finance and school funding. And the reason for that is, is we can't really deal effectively with property tax unless we deal, at the state level anyway, unless we deal with school finance. Because we don't have a, a, a property tax for the state. We do, again, fund so much of, of public schools and what we need to do in that, if we're really going to do something that's actually going to bring your property taxes down, then the state has to uh, absorb more of the school funding and let less of it be funded at the local level. Uh, that's really the only way you're going to see it. We had some really good bills go through the House and Senate and we'll have some good ones go through in the special session on property tax, but they don't really do anything to lower your tax bill. What they do is make it more transparent, allow you to participate in contesting it easier, and keep it from growing as quickly. But what everybody really needs is some, some significant property tax relief. I had someone who I won't name because most of y'all here know them, told me they're gonna go ahead and sell their house because they're just about at retirement age and they don't wanna continue with that you know, $8,000 tax bill during retirement. And so they're making, making other plans. And, and we should never have to do that. You shouldn't have to rent your house from the government for the rest of your life. So call the governor's office, ask them to expand that property tax idea and put comprehensive uh, school finance reform on that call. I think we're gonna get there, but he needs to hear from a lot of people. Another real prominent thing that affects us a lot here is annexation. Uh, we had a great bill uh, that uh, came out of the House and, uh, and it was about to pass in the Senate and the very last few hours of the Senate, it got filibustered and it was on annexation. And for us here in Parker, what it really did at the end of the day was said that Fort Worth uh, cannot annex into Parker County unless they get voter approval from Parker County to do that. And that was a huge thing in helping us negotiate the price that they would be, uh, the, 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 the terms under which they take properties and how we develop things. And if you're a property owner, it was a really big deal. So I, I, that, that bill needs to come back up. I mean, it was that close and it was filibustered by a, uh, a Democrat senator out of San Antonio, and, and I'm hoping that Craig and others are going to be able to kind of shove him out of the way next time, and we can get that bill done during the special session. Another one that's kind of had a lot of prominence that nobody in the legislature or in the world ever thought we would be dealing with is this transgender restrooms issue. Uh, I'm very confident that that will get through uh, in one form or another. I think it'll be um, uh, particularly trying to, uh, to just say that uh, that, that that, that cities and counties and school districts uh, really can't have a role in deciding what someone's gender is, that boys need to be in the boys' room and 
girls need to be in the girls' locker room at school, and we're not going to allow any crossover in those situations. If there are special situations, and those have been there forever, uh, schools have always done a really good job in Parker County of dealing with those in a very sensitive way. And so, uh, and they're, they're, and they're rare instances. So I think we'll probably deal with that. Those are probably the three most kind of media, uh, uh, ones you'll see in the media get the most attention right now on the call. You can Google special session and see the other 17 items and let me know what you think about those. We did, even though we kind of ran out of time, we did get quite a bit done this session. Uh, one of them I want to mention in particular is CPS and foster care reform. And that's been a huge, huge deal. Uh, our CPS care system and our foster care system for kids who are living in abusive situations, neglectful situations, dangerous situations, it had really just been overwhelmed by the growth in numbers. And we had not kept up with that as a community and as a state in making sure that those kids' uh, needs were being met. And it's very complex because courts and things like that are not a good place to deal with kids. They're not a good place to raise kids. Uh, the government really shouldn't be involved, but we have to be involved. And, it's, and we have so many families out there and people that ha are, and so many more that would be, are willing to be foster care parents, but it is so difficult to go through that. You have to go through a great deal of training, and then once you get, a, get to be a foster parent, there is so much paperwork and so much regulation, not even being able the way it has been, not even being able to go and have a babysitter come in and watch your foster child for the evening so you can go to dinner with your spouse without calling CPS and getting approval to do that. I mean, it got down to that increment, the paperwork that most people, once they became a foster parent, they didn't want to do it again because it was just too much to keep up with. So we've done a massive uh, uh, rewrite of that. There had been a public-private partnership going on as an experiment in Parker and Tarrant and a few other counties. Uh, it has been very, very successful and needs to grow. In fact, how many people saw the news reports, I mean, all the time about kids sleeping on the floor in a CPS office around the state. Y'all hear those things? Terrible, should never happen. You know how many times that happened in Parker and Tarrant County in the last year? Zero. Because we had a community partnership that was coming together and we were building on. That model is now going to be pushed out through the entire state of Texas. And, uh, and it, it's, it's, it's the way it really should, uh, should be done. You know, we've got to remember, these, these aren't the state's kids. Uh, and they aren't CPS's kids. In Parker County, there are kids, and there are responsibility to be uh, to be uh, being a part of them. So I'm hoping we've made some really good change in that. We put a ton of money into it, hired hundreds and hundreds of more employees, tried to streamline the system. It's going to take years for it to get where it should be, and being government, it'll never be all the way there. But uh, what we really want to see is those public-private, faith-based um, uh, uh, efforts really growing and and taking that over and and making it something of the community and not of something of some large state government uh, a long way away. Passed the Sanctuary Cities Bill, very, very controversial. And it, when you really peel away all the, un, the, the layers of the onions, all we really did was we said, if, and by the way, this didn't happen in Parker County. It didn't happen in most counties in Texas, but in some of your large urban counties, it, was hap it, it is happening. And we just said, look, if you're a sheriff or a police chief or a mayor of a city, you can't tell your officers not to enforce the law. If the federal government shows up with a warrant for the arrest of a bad person, uh, you can't ignore that warrant just because you don't uh, uh, want to uh, have participate in any enforcement of, of uh, illegal immigration. Uh, it's not targeting anyone. It's going after bad people. Uh, we, everybody remembers the case here uh, a couple of years ago in Parker County where you had someone break into a house in the middle of the night, try to sexually assault a little 12-year-old girl. That person had been deported four times, was already under federal probation. That, and if they have deported four times, they, brought, they got here illegally five times. That's the type of people that this type of law targets. And it simply says, you can't ignore the law. And if you do, now the state has the power to remove you from office if you're an elected official, a sheriff or a mayor or whatever you are, police chief, whatever you may be. We can fine your organization, and we can take away your state monies that you get, which are substantial. You would never see this happen in Willow Park. You would never see it happen with Larry Fowler, but it does happen around the state where bad people who had warrants for their arrest from the federal immigration folks were let out of jail uh, who were very serious criminals, and we're not going to tolerate that anymore. And that's what that Sanctuary Cities bill did. One thing we really do a good job on, which is really boring to talk about, but we really do a good job on our budget. 
Uh, Texas, uh, uh, we're always very fiscally conservative. Uh, that's exceptionally important. You see your tax bills, but we see what happens at the federal government. And if you don't have a budget, everything falls apart and breaks down. Our uh, a budget this time, you always try to make it grow uh, at, at a rate that is lower than the combination of population and inflation. And, and we kept it uh, substantially below that this time. In fact, dollar for dollar, it's almost exactly the same amount reallocated, but almost the same amount that it was uh, for, the, for the last budget we passed. And we always do a really good job at that. And most states don't. Uh, uh, most states have a lot of debt and a, and a lot higher taxes and a budget that's out of control, and Texas doesn't have that. In fact, we have a savings account that's upwards of 10. Our budget's about 212, or is it 217? No, 217, 217 billion dollars. And we have about a $10 billion savings account. Uh, and no other state has that. In fact, at one time, our savings account was more than all the other 49 states' savings accounts combined. So we have that there, and Craig and I both walked in when they said, hey, you got a $26 billion deficit because the economy crashed, and another time a $13 billion deficit because the economy crashed. And so we need a good, healthy savings account there to kind of make sure we get that. Uh, voter ID, that was actually a bill I carried uh, in the House. Uh, Ken Paxton, Attorney General, had come to me and asked me to, to carry it. If you remember back, in, we do have voter fraud. You see what's going on in Dallas. It is an issue. Again, it's really not much of an issue around here. We tend to find it in the, in the large urban areas. Uh, and, but it is a huge problem. You find it some down in South Texas. Uh, it, it, we passed a voter ID bill, which is just common sense. It says when you go to vote, so somebody else not stealing your vote, you ought to have to show an ID. I mean, you got to doing a write a check. We used to have to do it to rent a movie when we did that type of thing. But you have to have an ID for everything, right? And, and that's all we said in 2011. We said we want everybody to show an ID. Well, naturally, the federal courts didn't like it, so they threw it out. So we come, we've come back. We came back uh, in 2013 and tried to fix that, tried to comply with what the federal court said. Uh, they said that because someone might have to pay $3 to get a birth certificate to get an ID, that that was technically a poll tax. And however they figured that. So the federal court struck down the bill again. So anyway, we thought we fixed that two years ago. Guess what? Last year, the federal court struck it down again. And so Ken came and said, look, we, we've got to do this bill. We're going to try to try one more time. Uh, we think we've done it right this time. Uh, we think we can get the Fifth Circuit and the, and the U.S. Supreme Court to go with it. So again, we passed the voter ID bill. Hopefully, when you go vote this time, there's a, the judge had a hearing on it a week after we passed the bill. She's out of Corpus Christi. Frankly, she didn't know what to do. She didn't think we would have passed anything. And so we're waiting to see. I think she's going to strike the bill again and strike and, and, and join us from requiring, prevent us from, from requiring any, any IDs when you go to vote. Hopefully we can get it to the Fifth Circuit and get, get it reinstated before November when we have the elections. But it's just crazy and ridiculous. And I'll tell you that anybody that thinks that you shouldn't have an ID to vote, the only thing I can conclude is that they want to be able to defraud. They want to be able to do fraudulent voting because there's no other reason that someone should not want you to present an ID when you go to vote. So we'll see what happens. Uh, it passed with a high majority in the Senate and a pretty high majority in the House, and I hope it sticks. Uh, we had a great uh, uh, pro-life bill. Texas has always had a great record of pro-life. Uh, it was a very omnibus bill. We, you know, all the Planned Parenthood stuff with the fetal tissue sales, we prohibited that. Uh, we uh, required that fetal tissue remains be, be buried in a respectful manner. You know, they literally had been dumped, if you can imagine this, in, in landfills in Texas. That's what happens today. Uh, we uh, we uh, prohibited partial birth abortion. We ended the dismemberment uh, abortion, uh, which, which is even difficult to talk about. Uh, we continued the defunding of Planned Parenthood, and then uh, we, we uh, put $12.3 million with an ability for that to be doubled into alternative to abortion programs, things like what Grace House do. Had, a pre had some pretty good ethics legislation. Want all our elected officials to be ethical. Uh, one of the uh, more striking uh, uh, bills was uh, elected officials at any level will now lose their government pension if they commit a crime in the course of scope, bribery, or whatever it may be, undue influence, whatever it might be, insider trading type stuff. 
if they do that then they, uh, while they're in office, then in addition to getting in trouble with the courts, they, uh, uh, they will lose their, uh, uh, their government pension. A lot of religious liberty, liberty uh, bills came through. I uh, just want to mention uh, one of them, actually two of them. If you remember they, they, in Houston, when they had a, a dispute a while back and there were some, the, the city of Houston attorneys, there was a recall election on, an, on, a, on a bill, on a city ordinance, and, the, and the, a lot of pastors had got engaged in that issue. And, and the uh, uh, city attorneys got into a lawsuit and sued some pastors and tried to subpoena their sermon notes. Remember that from a couple of years ago? Uh, we prohibited that, uh, no longer in a lawsuit or any kind of thing like that. Will any, anyone be able to subpoena uh, the private records of a pastor? That's religious liberty. Although one of the pastors I really liked, he said he would give it to them eagerly if they would just promise to read his notes and his sermons. So, you know, I think Sherman would probably do the same. Uh, public education, oh, one of the others on the uh, religious, religious liberty issue. In, 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 there had been a lot of pressure on some of the uh, faith-based, I mean, about 40% of our adoptions in Texas are from faith-based institutions, Baptist Children's and things like that. So, but there was concern that they were going to be forced to do adoptions and be involved in foster care programs that were in contradiction to their uh, religious tenets. And in fact, in Ohio, Catholic Charities quit doing adoptions for that reason because they were going to be forced to do same-sex adoptions, which was against their religious tenets. So we, we carved out faith-based institutions in Texas and said, if you're in any way involved in CPS or foster care, you can not be forced to do anything because we want you involved in, in that process. We don't want to force you out of it. Uh, real quick, uh, public education. We, we covered all the funding and, uh, enrollment growth, which is usually a couple of billion dollars of new money to do that. We get about 80,000 new students a year in Texas. Uh, we put an uh, additional 75 million in for, for some school districts, a couple of them are mine, that uh, had real heavy property tax decrease due to uh, primarily oil and gas for us uh, prices and to kind of help them compensate for that. And then just a personal bill, it was one of mine that, that, that I had a lot of fun with. It was HB 89. Craig was a big, big supporter of it in the Senate. And it just said that, uh, well, there's this international, uh, little background, there's this international effort going on to have economic warfare against the nation of Israel. And it's, a, uh, uh, it's, it's growing. Governments are engaged in it. Uh, businesses are boycotting Israel. Uh, Netanyahu will tell you that it is the, uh, it is the most serious threat uh, uh, next to nuclear warfare. That, uh, that Israel faces because they have so few resources and they have to be able to be engaged freely in international commerce to get what they need and to, to do all the things to, to survive as a nation. And, 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 and what the boycott says is simply that companies and governments declare that they will not do business uh, with Israel. If you go to the EU and you buy a product, if it was made in the West Bank, now it has to say that it's made in the West Bank so you can know it and not buy it is the idea. So uh, uh, we passed some legislation. There's a number of other states that have as well. Texas is, is by far the strongest and the most important because of the size of our economy. And it's very simple. It says if you as a business, you want to boycott Israel, that's, that's, your, that's your right. But we're not going to let you use state tax dollars or any tax dollars uh, to help you do that. So what we prohibit is we invest about $250 billion a year of pension dollars in different companies to, to uh, build our pension benefits for, for state employees. Uh, we pro we've now prohibit any of those from being invested in any company that boycotts Israel. Uh, that takes $250 billion out of the marketplace for investment and that thing sends a big signal. The other thing we did, we said state, school districts, cities, counties, anybody, uh, you can't do any business. You can't exchange any commerce with anybody, any company that's boycotting Israel. So that if, uh, if uh, uh, Smith County School District is buying paper from ABC Paper Company and ABC Paper Company is boycotting Israel, then Smith, they can't buy that paper from them anymore. And when you think of the size of state government, Texas is $212 billion, you add in all the, the, the local governments, we're talking a lot of money being taken out of, out of the commerce chain going to companies that, that boycott Israel and that's been prohibited. Uh, it's kind of fun. I went to Israel and met with some Knesset members last fall and we kind of worked on this and, and uh, so when Abbott signed the bill, uh, he gave me a pen that I'm going to take to Netanyahu 
which was the pen that signed the bill. In fact, there's a little article the other day, Abbott was on a phone call from him and said, I gave Phil King the pen to bring to you. So that'll be kind of fun next fall, to do, next spring to do. Um, I go on and on, and because and, we really did get a lot done. We've got a lot left to get done. Uh, but if we've got, do we have a couple of minutes for questions? Is that, do you want to do that? Five minutes, okay. A couple of easy, really easy questions, maybe, anybody? <laughs> Say, Bill, what about the gold depository that they're talking about? Is that going to give us some state funds, too? Yeah, that's kind of fun. Texas has a lot of gold that's been deposited in New York. It was just a, a hedge investment that came up years and years and years ago. And Giovanni Capriglione, who's a legislator in Tarrant County, got this idea of why don't we start our own gold depository and, and move that gold back to Texas. That way when we succeed, it'll, you know, I'll work out a lot better. Just <laughs> but, but so the, the, it, it, the, he passed a bill a couple of years ago to do that. Uh, it's, it's in the process of being implemented. It's grown into a much larger project. And ultimately what you could see is it become, it, and what it, I think you'll see, is where we can deposit our own gold investments in. We can invest in gold investments that are on deposit there. And I think you could actually see kind of a Bitcoin type uh, commodity trading platform between businesses uh, for us to, 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 to do in Texas. Uh, there's no reason we can't do that. We're prohibited by the U.S. Constitution from print, printing currency, but certainly not coins and certainly not a credit card that says you have this much uh, on deposit in our gold depository and you would like to have some of that, so I buy your products or your services with that and now you own some of that. It's got a, a lot of fun potential. And Giovanni is way too intelligent for his own good and has all kind of ideas about this. So yeah, I think it's going to take off. And uh, in fact, the controller just designated someone in his office to be the liaison for managing the state funds when they're on deposit there. I've tried to get it moved to Weatherford. Craig was trying Wichita Falls. So far, it doesn't look like it's going to be either of those places. So. Yes, sir. Great question. How do, you, how do you identify the companies that are boycotting Israel? There's a list that's going to be published uh, uh, at the Comptroller's website. Uh, there's an organization that will actually, surprisingly inexpensively, uh, contract with to prepare that. And what will happen if you're a company that's boycotting, we're going to send you a letter and, uh, and we're going to tell you and, if, and, if, and, and give you opportunity to change your mind because that's what we want to happen. Uh, if we find we have funds in companies, we'll give the, that company time to quickly change their policy. Elsewise, we're, we're selling those assets. But it'll be a published list. And everybody can go look at it, which we want everybody to go look at. It. So. Maybe anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Councilwoman. Concerning on what, sorry? Clear cutting property owners rights to clear cut. Oh, you're talking about the tree bill? The tree bill. Okay, this is kind of a Greg Abbott personal thing. But in Austin and some other communities, if you go, if you clearing a lot, building a house, cut a tree down, whatever, they make you replace those. And, uh, and it gets complex and it's not very simple to have to go through that process. And Austin is particularly I don't want to say oppressive. Yeah, I'll say oppressive. Austin is particularly difficult to live in and do business with. And apparently some years back, the governor built a house, had to cut down an oak tree to build the house or a pecan tree, got into some issues with the city who wanted replacement. And this bill simply says, as I haven't seen it yet, but I, I expect that the bill is going to say that the city can't, can't force you to replace trees if you're clearing land or whatever. I hope that's to hope, and then there would be a statewide bill. It's kind of like we did with Uber. There's, a, there's this real tension going on between what authority should cities have, and, uh, what, where, does, where does their regulatory powers end. You know, a lot of cities had outlawed Uber, and, and I really liked Uber, and if you travel much, you really like Uber and that type of thing. But the problem was if, if say, Fort Worth outlawed Uber, and you were trying to take an Uber to to uh, DFW, you pass through like 10 cities just getting there. Well, wh whose regulations pre prevail? So we tried to look at kind of chain of commerce. So this time we passed a statewide approval of Uber type uh, platforms and uh, that business model and, and prohibited cities from, 
from regulating that. And, and there's a whole host of different issues and tensions, some things that are properly for municipal government, some things that are not. And uh, I guess we're going to find out where the tree bill falls in that. One last real quick. Yes, ma'am. How do you get, get decorum back into politics? You know, uh, I really don't want Austin to get to be like uh, Washington. I don't know what you do there. I have, even though we've got some great people up there, particularly from our area, I have very little confidence that they're ever going to accomplish anything. Uh, regardless who's president right now or not, it's, it's kind of discouraging at times. Um, we've always tended to get things done and work in a pretty bipartisan fashion in Texas. And a lot of our issues aren't R and D versus D. They're liberal versus conservative. They're, they're, there's a lot of libertarian influence. There's uh, rural versus urban. So there's a lot of things, but we've always got along real well. We don't have aisles that we sit on or stuff like that. Uh, I think Texas will continue to operate like that. I think we had something kind of unusual happen at the end of session. And unfortunately, that was some issues, some, some, some tension, really that grew out of immigration issues. That really is a federal problem and federally created issues. So I think Texas is going to continue to do really well. Uh, and uh, federal government, I don't know. But we do, but we do a good job down there getting along with each other and work real hard at it. And you gotta be thick skinned and you gotta treat people the way you wanna be treated. That's the number one rule. And if you do that, things usually work out okay. So I know that's time. Thank you very, very much for letting me be your state rep and, and for letting me be here today. Will you please turn this microphone off before I listen? <laughs> Thanks.